we're going to be looking at, um, I guess, some of the key trends in the market, um, as well as the, the the Netherlands, especially a focus on that. Um, and, and there's a lot of kind of key areas around ESG, logistics, residential, and we'll be picking up all of those. Um, but let's start, first of all, um, just with Madeline. Um, uh, Madeline's just going to give us a quick kind of overview of some of the key topics in the market, just as a launch pad for the discussion. Um, so over to you, Madeline. I just want to set the scene for you. Um, mostly when I talk about real estate, I start uh, with the Dutch economy and uh, how it's uh, performing at the moment, because it's very um, important for the real estate sector as well. Um, well, economic growth is back in the Netherlands. Um, we're probably going to finish 20, 2021 uh, with um, 3% uh, GDP growth, which is, well, quite uh, a nice growth number for the Netherlands. Um, the last quarter of uh, last year will probably uh, show a decline due to the, the, the lockdown we've had um, in the past, uh, well, in, in December. Um, but overall, uh, the, the outlook for uh, the Dutch economy is very good. Um, we expect uh, the Dutch economy uh, to grow by around the same number uh, this year as well. Um, a lot of uh, government support has been provided um, due to all the, the COVID measures that has been uh, needed, needed to be taken um and that uh well supported the economy as well and it um it supports uh well the, the employment in the netherlands as well uh, we've seen record low unemployment levels um which is very important for the real estate real estate sector as well uh unemployment is around 3.7 percent at the moment and you see in the graph that's uh, very, very low at the moment, which is causing all kind of problems as well, because there's a labor shortage in uh, a lot of sectors in the Dutch economy. Um, when we move over to um, the real estate uh, sector and how it performed last year, um, well, we've seen the investment volumes uh, decline quite a bit from uh, around 20, 20 billion in uh, 2020 to uh, a little bit over 14 billion in uh, 21. Um, that's mainly caused by um, a de decline in investments in residential real estate. Um, in the beginning of uh, 21, um, a, a transfer tax has been increased when investors are buying homes. So it increased from 2% to 8%. That's quite a significant uh, increase. And therefore a lot of um, uh, deals has been, had been expedited into 2020. So um, we've seen uh, in 2020, we saw uh, quite a big volume of investments in residential real estate. And in, uh, in 21, not so much. It, or almost was cut in half uh, in 21. So that's uh, quite a significant drop in uh, invest investment in residential real estate. Um, also, we've, saw, we've seen uh, a decline in retail uh, investments. Well, that's uh, yeah due to the fact that uh, the outlook for, the, yeah, for retail uh, isn't as good as, um, well, quite a year back already. So um, online shopping has been increasing a lot. So um, yeah, that, that um, yeah, shows that the re retail real estate has you know, quite some problems and we've seen it in the investment volumes as well. Um, offices, uh, we've seen a slight decline in investment volumes. Um, the second half of the year was quite good. We, have, um, we had two major uh, uh, deals, then the high tech cam campus in, Eindhoven and um, uh, uh, the office building in of ABN AMRO. It's the, uh, one of the largest banks in the Netherlands at uh, the Zuidas in uh, in Amsterdam. That were two quite big, um, uh, quite big deals that that were um, happening in the second half of uh, last year. Um, so all well, there are some other uh, sectors as well, but all in all, um, we've seen a decline. Um, but um, sometimes due to very specific reasons, um, supply has, can be a problem as well sometimes. So um, the outlook um, 
is quite favorable for uh, the real, real estate uh, market in the Netherlands. Um, there are some, um, uh, uh, um, yeah, well, maybe difficulties um, or things that could, um, well, influence the real estate sector as, uh, quite a bit um, um, next year. Um, government regulations, I talked about the transfer tax already. Um, we've seen some other um, uh, regulations uh, from the government that are impacting the residential real estate market. Also, um, uh, the log logistical market as well. Um, what we also are going to see probably is um, uh, what, what's going to happen in the labor market that is quite important for, uh, for the real estate market. Bankruptcies um, that are going to get going going to be a little bit higher due to uh, the, the end of all the the government support, uh, the the COVID support. So there are quite a lot of um, interesting topics. Um, inflation also very important that uh, that can affect the real estate market. But um, well, in general, the, the outlook is quite uh, favorable. Great, thanks very much, Madeleine. Um, really interesting to get those perspectives and, and pick up on the economic outlook for certain. Um, so what we'll do now is just do a quick introduction and you, you very gently didn't introduce yourself, Madeleine, there at the start. So let's, let's, let's do that now. And for those who don't know me, my name is Richard Betts. Um, I'm the publisher at Real Asset Media and we run a series of these events. I'm um, around 80 a year, um, including at MIPIM and Expo Real, just focused on key topics, but also key themes. And this is part of a series of Outlook events that we're running, focused both, both on the key trends, um, but also on the key markets and the perspectives on those, on those key markets as well. And what we try to do is, is make each one slightly different, so with a, with a different focus. This one's on the Netherlands, but we've also got a key focus here on, on residential, logistics, um, as well as sustainability and finance. Um, Madeline, let's start with you. Just brief introduction of, of yourself and the company. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm, uh, well, Madeline Buys. I'm, uh, since January, uh, so quite recently, uh, the Chief Economist and Head of Research at Colliers, Colliers the Netherlands which is uh, the, the, the large um, real estate advisory firm. And previously I've been uh, at ABN Emero for nine years as a senior sector economist for the construction and real estate sector. So I've been uh, following the real estate, real estate sector for uh, quite some time now. Perfect, thanks very much. Um, Rene, let's, let's come to you. Brief introduction of yourself and the company. Thank you, uh, Richard. My name is <clears throat> Rene Buck. I'm CEO of uh, Buck Consultants International, also known as BCI Global. Um, what we do is giving uh, tenants, developers, investors, and also pretenant authorities independent advice on real estate issues, um, particularly focusing on uh, certain sectors of industry where we help companies, tenants to find the right locations. Uh, we don't do that only in the Netherlands, but also we have our teams and offices in, in London and Frankfurt and in, in Shanghai, Singapore, and in the US. Um, so an independent real estate consultant company is working for a variety of tenants, a group of developers and investors, and uh, authorities who are developing offer, uh, policy frameworks. Great, thanks, Rene. Um, Elise, over to you, quick introduction of yourself and, and ASR. Sure, thank you very much, Richard. Um, I'm Elise van Herwaarde. I work as a sustainability manager for ASR Real Estate. We're a real estate investment management company based in Utrecht, the Netherlands. And we invest in real estate on behalf of institutional investors. And we also manage the real estate portfolios. Uh, and we've actually been doing so for over 125 years already. So we've quite a long track record. And we're another company of ASR, which is one of the largest listed insurance companies in the Netherlands. Um, and in doing so, we manage one fund per sector, being a retail fund, residential office fund, and a science park fund alongside a farmland fund. Um, and recently, we've also started our investment uh, activities in large renewable energy projects. So we've really got that uh, sustainability focused strategy. Great. Really interesting as well to see that crossover between 
you know, real estate and infrastructure assets as well, that, that real asset side, and that focus on alternatives, um, which, are, which are big trends generally. Um, Dennis, over to you. Um, just, a, just a quick introduction of yourself and, uh, and Berlin here. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Yes, um, I'm Dennis Alaat, uh, working as a deputy head of, uh, for Berlin Hub at the Benelux office. We are a typical wholesale uh, real estate bank focusing on um, on a larger real estate transactions um, uh, stabilized investment development developments uh, we finance we are headquartered in germany and uh, we are um, uh, we are also focused in foreign markets uh, france poland and the benelux uh, and i'm uh, representing the benelux and now in this uh, seminar of course uh, focusing on on the netherlands we have been active uh, in the Netherlands for more than uh, 12 years. We are here to stay. And um, um, we also have a strong uh, ESG uh, uh, risk analysis and uh, origination focus uh, lately. So happy to discuss this uh, further. Perfect. Thanks very much, Dennis. And maybe let's just start with you. Um, Madeline there mentioned some of the, the key themes um, going into 2022. Um, I suppose... What are what are those, Dennis, that, that you're seeing um, from from your perspective? What are, what are the key themes uh, in the overall market? You mean um, uh, now we see a lot of appetite in general. All asset classes um, uh, are um, especially logistics and residential. They are uh, very popular uh, still, and. Um, um, we see uh, that that's also combined with the uh, requirements from the investors to, to invest, of course, but they are also focusing more on the real core assets. And real core uh, does not only mean a good location these days, but it does also mean, uh, is the building energy efficient? Uh, can we ensure that new tenants who are uh, coming into this building, can we offer them uh, uh, sustainable uh, buildings so we also see that our clients are really focusing on uh, trying to uh, uh, buy or acquire uh, sustainable assets or that they can improve those assets on a short notice notice to become very sustainable so we uh, spe specifically on those two sectors and the office market as well we we see a strong focus on uh, on on, on Acquiring and then having a, having a plan in mind how to optimize it in terms of uh, sustainability. Elise, it'd be interesting just from your perspective to pick up on, on that point from Dennis around um, how particularly sustainability and some of the legislation is going to be influencing the market in, in 2022. Um, what's your take on that? And I suppose what are some of the key challenges in the market around that at the moment? Yeah, I think most definitely 2020 is the year to set our intentions. Um, actually for the future that we want to work on. Because I think um, what Dennis also mentioned, we really have to make clear how to become more sustainable. And that's also what all stakeholders are asking us for. So not only um, us as managers of the buildings, but also our investors, also the tenants, also uh, public entities are really asking us, how are you going to work towards that more sustainable future? And I think one of the biggest challenges in that case is um, data collection and also data analysis and really finding out how to get from where we are now um, the starting point so what what are our emissions at this point what do we do um, to uh, to in improve the environment and also how to get to that very clear goal of paris in 2050 so what what line can we draw between now and that point and then how are we going to reach that yeah no i think that's interesting um i wanted to pick up as well um renee We'll dive down into the sectors um, in a minute, but I, I guess um, logistics is one of those areas where there's, you know, there's been a lot of investment focus, a lot of focus on returns. Um, what are you seeing, I guess, in, in, in terms of that sustainability side? How important is that for the logistics sector? Uh, <clears throat> it's becoming more and more important for the logistics sector as well. Um, I think if you would look from a tenant perspective that uh, five years ago, sustainability was something for the CEO mentioning in the annual report, but on the work floor, it was not a hot topic. That, that has changed. Uh, also because a lot of investors in the logistics real estate market have their own ESG objectives, as Dennis and Elise were already alluding to. So that's an important element. Um, what you see is also that uh, the vast majority of the new buildings, the new logistics building in the Netherlands are uh, BREEAM certified one way or another. 
There is also a specific topic, um, um, as we know that uh, if you have these large distribution center, they look so fantastic for solar panels. But in the Netherlands, we have also at a number of locations difficulties to give that electricity back to the grid. So the companies want to do it. They are eager to set up their solar panels on the roof. Um, but um, um, the electricity grid is not ready for that. So our sustainability is uh, for the developers and investors in a building an important element, but also for the tenants, uh, you know, the e-commerce companies, the logistic service providers, the brand owners, the manufacturers who want to set up a distribution centers. Um, uh, sustainability has become for them also important, for example, also looking in which transport mode to choose to move your products around in Europe. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to drill down more into the, the logistics side in, in a minute. Um, but hey Richard, um, can I uh, add something as well about yes, yeah, sustainability? Absolutely. So we'll, yeah, yeah, okay. we'll, we'll set a rule that you can add something whenever you like. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> um, because I, I talked about the labor market and I think the labor shortage is going to be one of the biggest challenges when, uh, when talking about sustainability and uh, making uh, office buildings, for example, more sustainable. Uh, we did some research uh, just recently, 43% of the office buildings in the Netherlands isn't um, on uh, the sustainability level that they need to be. So, uh, and they, there's one year um, uh, ahead of us that they have to, um, well, comply with all the regulations. And I think that is going to be a, a very big challenge, how we get the people to, um, uh, to make our buildings more sustainable. I mean, that's an interesting point. And at least from, from your point of view, I guess, um, I mean, we mentioned a little bit the challenges there, but that's a major challenge. Um, I suppose, do you, do you have a view, I mean, looking particularly at your portfolio as well, um, how are you dealing with that transformation? Um, and what else are you seeing in the market? And I'll come to you in a minute, Dennis, in terms of the financing side of that, because that will be interesting to pick up on as well. Elise. Um, yeah, regarding our portfolio, I think... Um, we've done major efforts to increase all the energy labels of our offices yet so um almost all of our offices are already rated um an energy label a so well we're we're we i think we were lucky to be ahead of all the legislation because of course now costs are rising um for making buildings more sustainable but of course there's there's huge challenges and especially in the future I think regarding offices, the cooling demand that will arise uh, due to climate change will be another major challenge in that market. So increasing the offices to another energy label is if there's enough money possible, definitely. But then keeping up with future challenges will be increasingly difficult, I think. And it would be interesting to get your sense, Dennis, I think, on um, that sort of future of office topic generally, whether, you know, this idea of work from home has also influenced um, the financing perspective on on the office as a as a, as a sector, um, but also particularly on that transformation given the timeline that we're talking about. Yeah, no, that's that, that's definitely uh, uh, challenging, but also a very good uh, case uh, because there you see that legislation will now accelerate this process because you cannot avoid it anymore. And then it's interesting to see what what will happen because after this year you can have assets that cannot be used anymore that that's of course from everybody's perspective if you're an investor if you are a, a banker it's it, it's of course not a not a good uh, good forecast so uh, then then uh, th then it's very good to see uh, how uh, the market will react uh, either you are going to uh, renovate those uh, properties make sure that they will be compliant towards uh, energy efficiency uh, labels uh, or you will have assets. Yeah. What can you do with them? Uh, and I think that the, the banks will not passively follow. Uh, looking looking at uh, from from my own perspective, we as a bank, we uh, Berlin Hub takes ESG also very uh, very seriously. Yeah, we um, we have linked our uh, our uh, funding or uh, or we issued bonds, uh, we issued green bonds that are linked to our overall performance in our portfolio in terms of uh, carbon uh, carbon footprint. So if we are not uh, decreasing our carbon footprint within our portfolio, we have to uh, we, we have a, a more expensive uh, funding. So it is serious from from our end, uh, and we are not the only bank who will have some kind of a, a incentive uh, for themselves to make sure that their portfolio will be more uh, energy efficient. So uh, I think all 
the financial sector and the banks, uh, and, and perhaps we as, as a front runner, uh, more specifically, will also support this movement in uh, make sure that uh, people are involved in real estate are going to improve their assets, uh, preferably before the end of this year, of course, because then you will face the local legislation challenge. But in, in general, overall, all asset classes uh, on, on, the, on the short term, this will be the uh, route uh, we will be following altogether. Okay, good. Um, I'll, I'll pick up um, some of the specific challenges as well, at least with you in terms of the different sectors where ASR are, are working in. Um, but I wanted to pick up, Madeline, on one of the things you mentioned there um, in terms of the sort of broader macroeconomics. Um, and just look at, um, you know, inflation, interest rate rises. Obviously, there's different views in the market around that as to whether or not inflation is potentially positive for the real estate sector um, or whether or not interest rate rises might lead to more capital going into bonds rather than into real estate. Um, what's your overall sense of that? Well, um, first of all, uh, when looking at inflation, um, well, we, we used to think, well, it, it's going to take a few months and then it will, uh, uh, it will decrease, decrease again, so uh, we'll be fine. But I think the general consensus now, it, it, it will be quite high into 2023. So uh, this year, inflation will be quite high. Um, um, yeah. Most often, uh, how it's related to the well to real estate is, and if if interest rates are rising as well, and well, watching the ECB um, talk about interest rates, if they are going to raise um, the interest rates, it will be um, happening in the end of the year if they're going to do it. So I think uh, in general, we will be fine uh, from that perspective um, uh, with inflation uh, and, and interest rates this year. Um, but it can, because we see um, some uh, the, the more longer uh, interest rates, we see them uh, rise a little bit. It can, uh, for example, increase mortgage rates um, a little bit um, so you can see a little bit of an effect uh, this year as well. Um, so, well, hopefully uh, it won't impact uh, the real estate sector this year uh, that much. But um, I think the sentiment is it changes a little bit about what interest rates are going to do, because we're always uh, uh, expected that well, interest rates will be low uh, for a few years. I don't know if that's going to uh, stay the same. And uh, Madeline, and I'll be interested to get everybody's view on this as well. In terms of the the the, the challenges, I suppose um, the risk factors. You know, where do you things like you know we've obviously got tension um, with Ukraine and Russia, so there's political tension, tension with the US and China. Um, you know, so there's a lot of political focus out there, but you've also got then these economic headwinds um, and and potentially. You know, although we're hoping that the pandemic is in its sort of last blows here, um, that maybe, you know, that may resurface. Um, so I suppose what are you looking at as your sort of key risks um, when you're looking at the market, Madeline? And then I'll, I'll pick up views from everybody else as well. Yeah, I think uh, in general, uh, what you just mentioned, uh, for example, geopolitical events that are always a risk event also for, for real estate because it's very um, well uh, tightly connected to how the economy is doing. So um, if the economy is impacted by this, um, real estate is impacted by it. Um, but I think for the Netherlands and specifically, um, I see, um, and then for real estate, of course, um, like all the, the government regulations, I think that's quite a big risk factor at the moment. Um, because, uh, well, in the Netherlands, uh, the government want to deter uh, investors to invest in uh, mainly the, the residential real estate market. So I think that is quite a bit of a risk factor uh, this year. But okay, Madeline, just... if I may ask you a question, Richard, the, don't you expect that uh, as the, uh, the energy label uh, obligations that those will be relaxed. So uh, as you mentioned, so many companies or so many buildings still don't have the right energy labels. 
um, that uh, the government will say at a certain point in time this year, hey, due to the pandemic, companies didn't have to focus on that. And so we will relax the date that that should be arranged with another 18 or 24 months. What is your take on that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't think that they are going to relax uh, uh, the, the, the due date, but maybe they're going to say, well, we uh, the first year, we're not going to give you a fine if you're not complying. And then uh, after that, we're uh, going to um, uh, fine you. Uh, but you have one year extra, um, for example, uh, to get your, uh, your building uh, energy uh, efficient. Uh, but I don't think that they're going to um, uh, do something about the due date because, uh, well, sustainability, uh, there are a lot of uh, lawsuits about it. So I don't think they have the, well, the power maybe uh, to change the due date. Interesting. Good. Thank you for that. Thank you, Rene, for that question as well. That's good. <laughs> let's um, let's pick up um, uh, from your point of view, Dennis. Um, I guess, what are you seeing as some of the those kind of key key challenges? What's going to be influencing the bank? I mean, we've we've talked a little bit about um, the sustainability side, but is there a danger, do you think, of there being kind of distressed or stranded assets because of that? I, you know, I'm sure the banks will be trying and the investors will be trying to avoid that. But is there a, is there a danger of that? Is one of the is that one of the kind of key risks? Um, um... I think you will see uh, the difference between um, uh, the strong assets and the not so sustainable. Let's call it this. Uh, it's first time I heard this uh, this term, uh, stranded uh, assets. Assets. I think that that gap will will widen. Uh, so uh, of course, everybody uh, from an in, uh, everybody will focus on the on the uh, on the core assets that, that are compliant uh, everybody wants to rent those assets everybody wants to invest in those assets and in the end uh, a lot of banks wants to finance those assets so those assets will maintain liquid will uh, will be in high demand that's all good parameters for a strong value and then at at the other end the the stranded assets as you as you uh, called them uh, yeah, well, they they will face the uh, the other side of, of the of the flip coin. Uh, so uh, nobody wants to rent it, nobody wants to invest in, in them, or at least not as many people want to invest in them, and not all banks wants to wants to finance it. So that will become uh, a real topic, a real challenge. And of course, you will be you will you will see parties standing up specialized in uh, uh, turning around those assets, and that's that's good as well. But then you, uh, uh, then at least the uh, not the whole market will will be uh, capable of managing uh, restructuring those assets. And then once that's done and it's uh, more or less stabilized again, and it's it's a core and, and it becomes a core asset again, then I think it will it will has it will has the same appetite again. But but they will go through a through an intensive period of, 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 uh, of focus uh, at the investors and, and, and other people involved. Great. And Elise, uh, is that the role of then, um, you know, investors to be able to look at transforming some of these um, assets, you know, that, that may be left behind a little bit in terms of the legislation? Um, or is it more the sort of, that that will be a specialist fund coming in to reposition that asset, um, you know, do the work that's necessary, and then sell it on to a fund like ASR or another another one of the investment funds. I suppose, you know, who do you see doing that work to transform these assets? Um, well, I sincerely think that we all should take our responsibility in this um, energy crisis, or not the energy crisis, but I mean the climate crisis. I really think that we all should do what we can. And I also think that if we have been able to benefit from uh, returns over a certain portfolio or over a certain type of asset, then we should also take the responsibility to transform it into something that can actually well benefit us in the long term. Um, and I think for, uh, for us as a long term institutional investor it has been in our dna to do so already so for me it feels really unethical to resell a building as a at a, a moment when you think it will not well when it maybe eventually will strength um and you should really do all kinds of efforts to well to prepare for the future but on the other hand i think it should be possible i mean there's also a business case lying be beneath it and um well to finish up the business case we can also focus on 
for example, buying other sustainability assets um, to compensate for the um, money we have to spend on making the existing stock more sustainable. But yeah, so I think it's about finding a new balance between those. Okay, great. Um, I, I want to, we're, we're sort of 30 minutes in, so I wanted to just focus a little bit on some of the, um, some of the, um, the sectors here. Um, and Rene, obviously coming to you, logistics has been, you know, a huge topic over the last two years, accelerating, you know, in 2021 um, and, and looking to do the same again now in 2022. Um, what's your sense of where we are in the market at the moment and, and where we're heading with that? And, and feel free to pick up on your sort of global research as well and, uh, and also a little bit on the Netherlands. I think the, the logistics real estate industry, um, uh, the logistics real estate had a great uh, 2021. Um, also a little bit picking up the previous discussion, Richard, on risk, because um, for a lot of companies, manufacturers, logistics service providers, it's also um, a hot topic is supply chain risk. So not getting your products from Asia or whatever in the world to the right location. So what happens if, if a ship blocks the uh, Suez Canal or if they're due to the pandemic, you don't get your components or sub-assemblies out of China. W one of the reactions of companies is to increase their inventory levels in Europe. So to be sure that you are not running out of stock. So one of the reasons why uh, last year was a record year in uh, logistics real estate take up in the Netherlands was uh, also due to the fact that we had these supply chain risk and companies responded by that by filling more of their warehouses so that they could still deliver to their clients. Um, I think for the uh, for this year, we will see, uh, and I, I based myself also on a survey we did among um, the leading logistics real estate developers and investors in the Netherlands. This year, that will be probably lower than the, the expected take up of last year. 10% uh, lower is the expectation in the market. And that's not due to a lack of appetite, but it is um, due to the lack of uh, the right assets or the right locations, the space to develop a new warehouse. Um, there is a, a huge um, uh, fight between uh, residential, um, uh, agriculture, um, uh, logistics or industrial buildings, just uh, as the Netherlands is a small country with a lot of activities and people. So that battle um, for space is a very important element and is at this moment uh, limiting the opportunities for um, uh, new logistics buildings to be set up. So it's, it's not a matter of lack of appetite, it's lack of uh, space. I think also what uh, Madeline said in her um, opening presentation is that labor shortage is also something which is going to influence the logistics industry as well now. And the Netherlands, uh, like in many other European countries, it's the same as for Belgium, Germany, the Czech Republic. You, a lot of uh, labor migrants are coming into the, uh, into the country. Um, but the labor shortages are now so huge. And, and I think everybody re uh, recalls that when we, had in the, when we were in the first and second quarter of the pandemic in 2020, we all had discussions on what kind of recovery will we have. You know, a V-curve, a U-curve, a... Uh, W curve, uh, an L curve, uh, the whole alphabet was, uh, let's say, was on all presentations. But today we can clearly see that in the US and in many European countries, we really had a, a V recovery. We are, in terms of employment and unemployment, back on the December 2019 level. So, and that means also that that labor shortage is has an important element, not only for transforming um, uh, buildings, as was just mentioned, but also for companies who want to hire new warehouse workers or whatever type of specialists. And I think that the, the labor shortages or the, the labor market tightness will also have uh, an impact on um, the, the labor costs you have to pay. And then you have a kind of combined uh, impact. On the one hand, you have inflation, uh, and on the other hand, uh, above on the inflation rate, which is then for this year, say 4% or so, uh, that on top of that inflation, you will get also uh, labor cost increases just due to um, um, the lack of availability of the right talent. So in summary, labor market, um, yes, there is still appetite from developers and investors and companies who want to set up. We see um, um, uh, 
the rent levels going up, also due to uh, because inflation is reflected in the, in the consumer <laughs> price indexes, which are on nearly all uh, contracts, whether it's for an office or for logistics real estate. We see also yield compression because logistics real estate is such an interesting asset class, has become such an interesting asset class, also because investors moved away from hotels and retails to more safe havens like uh, the logistics real estate, meaning a lot of people want to invest in that. Um, uh, supply is relatively limited, so uh, yields are going down. Okay, interesting. Um, it would be good. Um, Madeline, how, how does that compare in terms of, let's say, you mentioned the residential sector, which has been another hugely hot topic. Um, I, I suppose, how does that view on, on logistics compare with, with the residential and living sectors? Yeah, what, just, what Renee mentioned, I um, agree on that the fight uh, for, for space in the Netherlands is, uh, well, there is, uh, there's quite a fight at the moment. Uh, uh, what are we going to give priority? And well, what, what we're seeing at the moment is that um, the housing market is getting priority over a lot of things. Uh, for example, uh, had logistical locations. Uh, sometimes um, uh, cities even want to build uh, houses uh, very close uh, to more, uh, more those kind of locations, um, and that's it's it's it is very interesting to see. Um, but it's um, it's it's difficult for for the uh, for the for the INL the, the logistical sector because uh, when there are houses in the neighborhoods, um, um, the, running a business is becoming um, much more difficult. So um, I agree a lot with uh, what Renee said. Maybe I have a question uh, for Renee as well, because what we've seen in the recent years is that uh, there's all kind of supersized um, uh, logistical buildings. Do you expect uh, that we're getting more of them uh, still, or are the locations becoming smaller uh, the coming years? I think the, um, uh, thank you for that question. I think the drivers behind uh, um, to have uh, more mega distribution centers or XXL warehouses, so say about 40,000 square meter or 400,000 square foot. Um, the drivers behind that in terms of economies of scale, uh, in terms of, hey, for e-commerce operations, you need more space because you have to deal with returns, for example. So uh, I think those drivers are still there. Uh, I expect that the huge growth we have will level off the next couple of years. Um, and not because companies don't want that, but we will not have uh, the locations available to set up a, a large warehouse. Because if you have a, um, a large warehouse of, say, uh, 60,000 square meters, then you are all of a sudden already looking for uh, a plot of 100,000 square meters or 10 hectares. And that's pretty much in the tight um, uh, industrial markets we have right now. So. Here is also, it, it, I, I don't think it's about the appetite, but if the supply isn't there, um, you have to move on. Um, and there's a huge demand for residential in the, in the Netherlands market. Um, I guess, how, how practical is it? You know, it looks as though there should be a huge amount of growth coming um, in, that, in the residential market there in the Netherlands. Um, but does that require changes in terms of regulation, in terms of, uh, you know, the market to be able to move that forward, Madeline? Um, yeah, well, uh, I think the, the ambition at the moment from our government is to build 100,000 uh, new homes every year. Uh, we're looking around like 65,000 at the moment. Um, what we see the, the main problems when building houses building new houses is for example finding the land to build them on um and all the the whole procedure um to get uh to get uh all the um the licenses etc in order to start building the house so that sometimes take 10 to 15 years uh in order to build uh well and uh, hundred or a thousand new houses. So um, I think the whole process um, is very long and it, it takes uh, quite a lot of time. So um, I think that is the main uh, problem when uh, looking at uh, the housing shortage at the moment in the Netherlands, that the, the process uh, for building houses is, is taking uh, a lot of time. 
Okay, good. And Elise, is there is there more of a focus, do you think, on affordable housing and, and those kinds of things, particularly in the Netherlands, which has been very strong, actually, on the sort of ESG impact side? Um, well, there's definitely a large demand for affordable housing, an increasing demand, actually, um, also due to all of the political factors that we've mentioned before. Um, but it's also increasingly difficult to realize affordable housing because one of the trends indeed is being uh, uh, talked about already is um, increased labor costs. So building houses is super, very expensive. Material costs are increasing also due to the pandemic, um, also due to the higher demand. So um, actually constructing affordable housing is very expensive. Um, so we really need all partners in chain to collaborate on realizing affordable housing. Really one of our impact investing strategies is to come up with affordable housing and we don't do it alone. That's not, let's say the secret behind the strategy. We really have to collaborate with, for example, public entities so, such as municipalities to, um, yeah, to decrease, for example, ground pricing um, and work towards the common goal of realizing affordable housing in certain uh, specific areas in the Netherlands. So that really requires a commitment of a lot of stakeholders. Okay, great. Um, Dennis, I, I wanted to come to you and pick up on any of those uh, on any of those points. Um, but also, I'd be interested to get your kind of view on the financing banking markets more more generally, particularly for for the Netherlands, um, and what sectors you're you know where you're actively looking to lend, and any sectors where you're maybe looking less at lending at the moment. Uh, let's 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 start with the residential market since we we uh, have now discussing this uh, this market. That's of course a very popular uh, market. Um, all kind of investors uh, are stepping into that. Uh, we as a bank are also very positive uh, about that market in terms of outlook, in terms of um, also indeed the social impact you you can have on uh, on uh, supporting these kind of uh, investments because indeed there's a huge shortage in the Netherlands not only for high-end residentials but also from the middle rent and also from for for the for the social rent affordable rent uh, so uh, and, and uh, we as a bank uh, we as berlin hub um, we, uh, we have, we, have a, uh, we do like uh, the uh, we the most often see the middle rent uh, portfolios uh, and we do finance them the most because uh, indeed from an economic pers perspective you 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 see that those portfolios are, are still being bought uh, or, or traded. And that's, uh, that's what we have financed uh, lately a lot. Um, but indeed also from the, for, the, for the social houses with the lower uh, regulated uh, rents, uh, you see that it's, it's, uh, it's very tough to, uh, to, uh, to realize that portfolio as, as Elisa was mentioning, because you need the whole, uh, the whole chain to cooperate. Um, um, but in the end, the residentials uh, in that sector, uh, middle rent, social rents, uh, are uh, of high interest uh, from our end. Uh, and uh, especially combined with, again, the, some sustainability uh, business plans, uh, we can definitely uh, support those investments. The same goes for uh, logistics. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, René is happy, uh, happy to hear that. But uh, that's, of course, uh, in general, a high demand. But what you see in the, uh, especially in the greenfield, greenfield developments, all those developments, they, they already have very high sustainability standards. Uh, you almost do, can't find an, an, an brand, brand new development without a very good BREM certificate. Uh, I think they're already setting the market. I think the challenge in that market is how to deal with the brownfields. Uh, there's a lack of perhaps new space. There will be a higher focus on, on existing perhaps uh, older buildings, how can you turn those assets around towards the same uh, levels as you do with your uh, greenfield uh, developments. We are, uh, we are uh, supportive of those, uh, those initiatives as well. Uh, and we are very interested in those. If, if the business plan uh, is, uh, is solid, we can, uh, we can definitely uh, su support those. And then um, uh, other, other market segments which are of our interest uh, are, um, of course, the office market still. Uh, but that, that, that uh, faces the challenges we, uh, we, in the beginning of this seminar, discussed. Regulation uh, also uh, making sure that uh, it will comply with the new uh, sustainability standards. And, and, and overall, you see uh, at Berlin Hub, we, we really committed ourselves towards the... Uh, 
decreasing carbon footprint of our uh, financing portfolio that contain all these kind of asset classes. Um, so we will uh, try to contribute from our end uh, to support uh, people uh, buying those assets, owning those assets, and wanting to improve those assets. Great, thanks. Um, really interesting to get that, that perspective on, on the financing side, Dennis. Um, there's been a big focus, of course, on um, alternatives. If you look at both in rev and ULI emerging trends, um, investor intentions, they pick up a lot of areas um, which would have before very much been seen as alternatives, including the sort of life sciences, data center sides. Um, just starting with you, Madeline, I mean, uh, is there an increased focus on that, um, particularly in the Netherlands as well? Yeah, yeah, we see that as well. Uh, for example, uh, in science parks, but also in the healthcare sector, uh, we see a lot of interest uh, in these kind of, of homes or facilities because, well, the Dutch uh, population is aging as well. So there's a lot of appetite for uh, for those kind of more alternative uh, sectors uh, in the Netherlands, for sure. OK, great. Um, and uh, Rene, I, I know this is a perspective you've you've had on on this particular area as well from from your business, as well as logistics, that this is an area you're kind of looking at. I think that the, um, let's say, specific asset classes um, are becoming more and more interesting as there is so much investment money in the market. Um, I think if you talk about uh, science park or innovation parks or campuses, um, it's something which was a number of years ago uh, uh, not seen as an asset class. And now you see with uh, major deals, uh, not only in the Netherlands, but also in the UK and in, uh, in Germany, that it is becoming an asset class because whatever, whatever direction the economy will take, innovation and accelerating innovation is here to stay. And that means that companies are looking, how can I win uh, the race for new products, new processes, new platforms, new technologies, and then um, uh, locating next to uh, one of the 13 universities in the Netherlands might be an interesting opportunity to pick up the brains and not only the people, but also uh, patterns or uh, new products uh, which have been developed into your own portfolio. So I think science parks and campuses is, 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 a, is an asset class um, uh, which, will be, uh, which will be an interesting asset class next year. We see a little bit the same in data centers as you mentioned, but I would say to a lower extent because um, the, the, the super size, um, what they call in the industry, hyperscale data centers that's often paid by uh, the Facebooks and the Googles and the Microsofts themselves. So that's, that's not much of that. But I think um, if you talk about life sciences, we saw obviously in the pandemic uh, how important these um, uh, development, but also manufacturing of vaccines is, um, uh, was for the health uh, of, of all of us. Um, so I think that will be uh, an asset class, uh, which is there, and you saw already AXA uh, setting up a huge life sciences fund. Um, um, Madeline already mentioned that last year, the high-tech campus in the Netherlands, formerly owned by, uh, in, the, in the beginning by Philips, but later on by a private investor who sold it um, last year. Uh, so that, that is definitely something uh, which will be interesting in the next year. And that's also, you can see it already, the fact that um, on these specific um, innovation uh, uh, buildings, R&D type of buildings on these science parks, a couple of years ago, you still could see their yields of six, 7%. That's not the case anymore. So it shows also that the market has an appetite in it as well. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, if you'd have asked me two years ago, would we have been doing a session, you know, focused around real estate and health tech and precision medicine, I would have said, I don't know what you're talking about. But actually, that's what we did yesterday. Um, yeah. So it's just interesting to see how these, which were perceived to be incredibly niche parts of, uh, I suppose, office, um, are now developing into sectors of their own of their own right, and also beginning to move closer in. You're absolutely right, Rennie. There, I think. Um, to to both the city centre, um, but also close to universities and areas, particularly for health tech, where there's um, hospitals and, and those kinds of things in order to be able to work. But also, interestingly, in the session we had yesterday, um, which also took Glasgow as an example, there was also the perception that there's going to be a move to create more manufacturing next to this as well, 
um, particularly for the drugs companies, um, because again of that supply chain issue that you mentioned as well, Rene, and the and the desire for people to be able to to actually create it in their own countries locally. Um, so really interesting, I think that. Um, and Elise, you mentioned at the start that you're focusing there as well at ASR on um, some of the other funds, renewable energy funds. Um, do, do you think there's going to be more of a more of a crossover, I suppose, into some of these life sciences, uh, more of the niche sectors, and also an increasing focus on things like renewable energy as part of a real asset strategy? Um, yeah, I definitely do so. Uh, I personally personally believe so, but I. Um... Well, actually, ASR Real Estate also manages a science park fund already that we've launched in 2019. So, um, yeah, that, that fund is, is rapidly expanding. And it's also, uh, well, a widely acclaimed impact investing um, vehicle as of 2020. And I really think that proves that um, there is enough interest to, to inst invest in at least that category. And also the renewables um, projects yeah, the difficulty there is that, of course, it concerns very large projects and that that's also kind of a new um, investment uh, niche, as you mentioned before. And it's also quite well, there's a lot of transition risks coming in when you're looking at such new investing opportunities. But I think um, the, the need for that kind of projects is increasing, definitely. And um, I also see it with investors that we're talking to now that that's the interest in our renewables projects is also increasing. So I, I really think that, that that's also there to stay, definitely. And just okay, to give some, some credit to ASR, they set up their um, uh, the, uh, their Dutch Science Park Fund, which, uh, as, as um, Elise mentioned a couple of years ago, and that was really seen in this, the market, oh, wow, a, a strong uh, investment company like ASR is now investing in these kind of buildings uh, around science parks in the Netherlands. So that was also a proof of this is an emerging asset class and not just having an investor having here and there some buildings. So that, that was a, a really, in, in terms of becoming more and more a professional market, the step of ASR was definitely an important one. Yeah, right. thank you. And initially it seemed like a really courageous step or something, but then, well, I think now we're proving that it was already, well, kind of mainstream and logical choice for us to do so. But, and, and Madeline, do you just want to touch on areas like um, retail, for example, hotels and leisures from Collier's perspective, um, some of the some of the other um, sectors that we haven't quite touched on yet. I mean, interesting to get your perspective on retail, especially. Yeah, uh, when we are looking at the retail market, well, it, it faces a lot of challenges. Uh, I think we all know that, um, well, uh, COVID, um, a lot of uh, stores had to be closed. Um, but uh, we've seen those challenges for uh, a couple of years now, also due to online shopping. And I think uh, the main and interesting point, what we are seeing is that um, uh, mostly the, the retail locations uh, based in the inner cities, they have the most problems. Uh, vacancies uh, are rising over there. Uh, and, and other uh, locations uh, like uh, grocery stores, but also the more local um, local areas uh, that are doing quite well. So not the whole retail uh, market is performing badly. So I think that's uh, that's an important uh, nuance uh, nuance to make. Um, and uh, well, well, you talked a little bit about more the hospitality, uh, ho the hotel sector. Well, of course, we've seen uh, less tourism uh, due to COVID. Uh, and we've seen that uh, a lot of people uh, in the Netherlands are going on a holiday in the Netherlands. Um, so um, uh, we've seen that uh, happening the, the past two years. Well, we expect tourism to to come back um, uh, this this year already. Uh, so that's very good. Um, but I think the the, the part uh, more in the hotel sector that that is going to face challenges still is the um, the part that is are focusing on the business travelers because we've seen well we're doing it now as well uh, that you can uh, use zoom or teams uh, for a lot of meetings so um, I think that isn't going to pick up anytime soon as we've seen uh, before covid okay interesting um, and uh, just just quickly does anybody see I mean the Netherlands um, actually the main cities are, are relatively close together in any case. 
Um, but with the sort of work from home elements, um, does that mean there's it, it more kind of focus on um, regional cities um, as opposed to the, the sort of, you know, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Utrecht? Um, is, is that more investable going forward, some of those, uh, those smaller cities? Or what's, what's your sense on that? Is, is there a kind of change? Because that's, that's been the case, certainly, um, a little bit in the UK and also in France in recent discussions we've been having. I don't know if anybody wants to pick that up. Yeah, I think I think we've seen that the trend in the Netherlands as well, um, especially when it comes to the housing market. Um, a lot of people are moving out out of the cities to, um, yeah, to more uh, secondary places in the Netherlands. But I actually think that doesn't only have to do with the pandemic and with the possibility of working from home, but also with the increasing um, uh, housing costs. I mean, living in the Netherlands is becoming increasingly expensive. So that really forced people that are expanding their families, for example, that are getting a bit older, they're looking for a more comfortable place to live, are forced to move to um, places out of the, the primary regions. Great. And, and, um, and, that, uh, and if I can add to that, um, uh, and that is being accelerated by the fact that in the Netherlands, although the Dutch can always complain about it, but we have an excellent public transportation system. So that makes it also easier if for uh, if housing in the major cities is not affordable. Um, you can um, um, live, let's say, um, 45 minutes away and in the train you can already work on your email or play on your phone. So um, I think it's less pandemic oriented uh, and more uh, what uh, Elise is mentioning. It's less pandemic oriented, but more affordable housing. Uh, is more driving people out of uh, what we call in the, the western part of the country, the Randstad. Um, but it's still, these are still the hottest economic locations. So there is still a huge flux of new people coming into those cities as, the, as it is the concentration point of the economy. Great. Um, our hour is almost up. We've got around two minutes left. So um, just, just a quick sort of... Um, brief kind of 20 seconds, I suppose, from everybody on what you're seeing either as a key trend or, or an opportunity in the market. Um, let's start with you, Rene. Um, I think overall, um, the, 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 the key trend will be, uh, in my opinion, um, let's say to find for the various asset classes in real estate, really the land, the space to do it. Uh, it's even also if you you mentioned science parks and innovation park, but if you have those inner city, then you have also, again, the battle for space. So I think the, the battle for space is uh, something which, um, which will um, rule for a number of years. And obviously the perspective of a tenant can be completely different for, as for an investor, because for an investor, lack of supply can be interesting, while for the tenant, um, he or she wants to have an opportunity to choose various offices, various logistics centers or whatsoever. Great, thanks. Elise. Thank you. Um, well, for me, the key trend is actually something that we haven't mentioned before, um, but it has to become a key trend for all of us uh, that besides cutting our emissions, we also really have to adapt to climate change. I think that's something that's becoming increasingly important and that knowledge is rapidly expanding. So we really have to start focusing on that too. Great, thanks. Madeline. Well, I think um, what is very important uh, this year is what kind of impact has the real estate sector on society and how can it be as beneficial for society as possible? Great, thank you. Um, and uh, last but not least, Dennis. Yes, thank you, Richard. Yes, I um, uh, I fully agree with uh, the uh, uh, the mindset of the of, of, of all people that we uh, are at, at a certain point in time that we have to do something about uh, climate change and a carbon footprint, and that will be translated practically into a market uh, on uh, on overall all asset classes on a real focus on sustainability, ESG focused investments or uh, turnarounds for those uh, assets. Um, if you are not uh, willing to follow that strategy or follow that path, then then, then you will. Uh, I think you will have a hard game. This this will be the next phase into investment markets. Uh, it will be the baseline level. Uh, you have to make sure that you contribute. Great, thanks very much. Really interesting to get everybody's perspectives. Um, we covered a lot of ground in that session. Really, really good to get your views on the, the key trends and also the outlook, particularly for, for the Dutch markets.
Um, thanks very much for, for all of your insights. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, the next sessions that we've got um, here in the, the RealX Auditorium are going to be focused on Germany next week. And then following that, we've got a special focus on ESG. So please do join us for those. Um, if you're also watching this session on demand, um, thanks very much for watching and look forward to seeing everybody at the next one. Thanks very much.